Hello friends, and welcome to Worship at Woods. Today is Christ the King Sunday. Next Sunday, we begin the celebration of Advent at 9.30 online. Don't miss that. Today, too, at 11, well, from 11 to 12.30, we are having the Advent drive through You can come to the Woods parking lot and pick up your Presbytery lights, luminarias, and Advent bags for the children in our parking lot. And on Wednesday, Thanksgiving Eve at 12 noon, we will gather virtually it for Thanksgiving worship. You can join the service on our website or, or at Facebook, on our Facebook page or on our YouTube page. And today, let's pray and celebrate Christ, our risen King. God and Father of our Lord Jesus, we come to you in Jesus, the one who was rejected, the Savior who appeared defeated, yet the mystery of his kinship startles and illumines our lives with light. Show us, we pray, in this time of worship, show us his death and his victory, resurrection life, crown him in all the ages in the love that unites heaven and earth. We ask this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you. 
please join me as we call ourselves to worship God. We come together to celebrate and to worship Christ our King, who, though he was in the form of God, did not consider being equal with God something to exploit. Instead, he emptied himself completely, not only taking on human form, but the form of a servant. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even a humiliating death by torture on a Roman cross. For this reason, God raised Jesus with great honor and gave him a name above all other names, That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is our God, the God we have come to worship. Let us come before God in a prayer of confession. Let us pray. We confess to you, our King of majesty and justice, we confess what we are. We are not the people we like others to think that we are. We are afraid to admit even to ourselves what lies at the depths of our souls. We have failed in our calling to be your holy people a people set apart by hope for your purposes of justice and healing. We live more in apathy born of fatalism than in passion born of hope. We are moved more by private ambition than by social justice. We dream more of privilege and benefits than of service and sacrifice. Reshape our hearts, O God, and reshape our lives for your kingdom that we can live and move and dream according to that hope to which you have called us. Forgive us, revive us, and mold us in your image. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. God has granted a glorious inheritance for his holy people. If you are in need, our God is with you. If you have been blessed, God has called you, for God is our King, and his ways are ways of peace and healing. Thanks be to God. We are called to be a people of peace and healing.
Amen. Good morning. I invite the children to come a little bit closer so we can visit for a moment. I'm Holly Albrecht, and I'm glad to be with you this morning. I've got a couple things I want to show you. We'll start with the easy one first. So what do you think this is? You're right, it's a crown. This might be a crown that a king would wear on his head. Kings are pretty important people. They wear fancy clothes and they have jewels and gold. They have servants that wait on them. Maybe they live in a castle. People do what they say. They are important people. The other thing I want to show you, this is a shepherd's crook. Shepherds use this to take care of their sheep. If a sheep gets away from the flock, a shepherd will use this, the crook to pull her back into her family. Shepherds are important people. They keep their sheep from harm. They take care of them. So today I want to talk to you about a special day in our church. This is Christ the King Sunday. Christ the King Sunday is the Sunday when we remember the most important king of all, the king of the world, Jesus. And the shepherd's crook and the crown remind us of what kind of king Jesus was. Jesus didn't wear fancy clothes or a crown on his head. He probably wore a simple robe and sandals. He didn't live in a castle. We all know he was born in a stable, a barn, and lived a simple life. Jesus didn't have lots of jewels and gold or servants. Jesus served others by healing them and teaching them. He even washed his friend's feet to remind them that they should serve others too. And Jesus didn't rule the world with a heavy hand. He ruled with love and kindness and acceptance. And Jesus expects us to live that way too. So on Christ the King Sunday, I want you to remember the crown and the shepherd's crook as reminders of Jesus, the King of our hearts and of our lives, and a reminder that we need to live with love and kindness and acceptance too. Let's pray together. Holy God, thank you for Jesus, the King of our lives, and help us to live with love and kindness and acceptance to amen he is king of kings he is lord of lords jesus christ the first and last no one works like him oh he is king of kings he is lord of lords Jesus Christ, the first and last, no one works like him. He built his throne up in the air, no one works like him. And called his saints from everywhere, no one works like him. Oh, he is King of kings, he is Lord of lords. Jesus Christ, the first and last, no one works like him. Oh, he is King of kings, he is Lord of lords. Jesus Christ, the first and last, no one works like him. Please join me in a prayer for understanding. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you would calm our hearts and prepare us to hear your word. Help us to be open to the lesson that you would have us hear this day. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 15 through 23, reading from the Inclusive Bible. From the time I first heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of the holy ones, I have never stopped thanking God for you and remembering you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Savior Jesus Christ, the God of glory, will give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation to bring you to a rich knowledge of the Creator. I pray that God will enlighten the eyes of your mind so that you can see the hope this call holds for you, the promised glories that God's holy ones will inherit, 
and the infinitely great power that is exercised for us who believe. You can tell this from the strength of God's power at work in Jesus, the power used to raise Christ from the dead and to seat Christ in heaven at God's hand, far above every sovereignty, authority, power, or dominion, and above any other name that can be named, not only this age, but also in the age to come. God has put all things under Christ's feet and made Christ, as ruler of everything, the head of the church, and the church is Christ's body. It's the fullness of the one who fills all creation. Here ends our first reading. Once upon a time, in a land far away, that's how fairy tales began. But this one is a parable by the 19th century philosopher Soren Kierkegaard. There was a king who loved a peasant girl. Now, this was no ordinary king, but an unequaled in might, ruler for whom every other ruler on earth trembled. And he, he had armies that could crush any enemy. Yet this mighty king melted in love for a humble maiden. He wanted to marry her. But how? What could he do if he announced his love for her, if he, if he brought her to the palace and crowned her head with jewels and clothed her in silk and linen? She would not object. No one dared object to him. But would she love him? How would he ever know if she truly loved him? Oh, she would say she loved him, of course, but would she? Or would she live with him privately grieving all that she left behind? Would she be happy? How would he ever know? If he rode to her cottage in his royal carriage with a garden and bright banners flying, would that overwhelm her? He, he didn't want a subject. He wanted a queen a lover, an equal. He wanted her to forget that he was a king. He wanted her to love him with a love that would, would span the gulf between them. Kierkegaard concluded his story saying, it is only in love that the unequal can be made equal. Convinced that he couldn't elevate his beloved without crushing her, the king decided that he must condescend. So he removed his robes and crown and, and put on the clothes of a beggar. He approached her cottage incognito with a worn coat fitting loosely around him. Hmm. It was no disguise. He renounced his throne in order to win his love. I, I love reading Kierkegaard's stories. This Christ the King Sunday, this last Sunday of the church year, is the day that we celebrate our humble King. The Bible, as, as well as theologians of the ages and reformers, have, have often referred to the church as the bride of Christ. Today, his church, his bride, crowns Jesus King of kings and Lord of lords. We sing and, and celebrate his eternal reign. Today is also the day that we recognize that Jesus is not a typical king. In our call to worship this morning, we recognize that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself taking the form of a servant. Christ the King is the sovereign leader, ruler of the universe, co-creator of all, who chose to condescend for the sake of love. And so he became what we are in order to win us for God. In order to bring us to God, he became like us so that we may, in some small way, become like him. 
Today, we're looking at the third of three of Jesus' parables in Matthew chapter 25. Last week, we read the parable of the talents, and, and two weeks ago, the parable of the ten bridesmaids. Now, these are cautionary tales about our need to prepare for the day of Christ's return. When this humble God will come and sit on the throne of glory and, and all the, the tribes and peoples of the earth will gather around him and it will be glorious. At that time, Jesus says, the judgment will begin. And for one wonderful or terrible moment, each of us will look into the eyes of our king. And with a the nod of his head, he'll direct some of us, the sheep, to one side of his throne and the other, the others of us, the goats, to the other side. Then he'll say to the sheep, come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And those on the left, the goats, to them the king will say, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me naked, and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Now, the difference between the sheep and the goats was that the sheep saw the suffering of the world and had compassion but the goats, the goats didn't. They didn't look. A and here's the surprise in the story. Both the sheep and the goats were startled by this verdict. Jesus continued. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food? Or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when did we see you, a stranger, and welcome you, or naked, and give you clothing? When was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them. Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. But to those who did not see did not notice the brothers and sisters of the king, he will say, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to it, into eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, in the case of both the sheep and the goats, Seeing is very, very important. This parable is similar to others of Jesus' stories, like, like the one about the rich man and a beggar named Lazarus, a poor man who lay at the rich man's gate, hungry and, and covered with sores, but the rich man never saw him. Today's parable is also like Jesus' story of, of the man who was attacked by robbers and, and left by the side of the road. A priest came by, and, and then a Levite, but they looked away and refused to see him. Finally, and fortunately, a Samaritan saw the injured man, saw him, and helped. In today's story, both the sheep and the goats say... Lord, when did we see you? Oh, Lord, that was you? Well, if we'd known it was you. And then the king will reply, I came as one of the least. One who was hungry, thirsty, naked, sick, or imprisoned. That was me. The stranger you welcomed. 
the refugee? That was me. I was the new kid in your class and your elderly neighbor struggling to get his groceries into the house. I was the woman who asked you for bus fare last week and the kid with the runny nose who made you uncomfortable in the checkout line. Did you see me? And some of us will say to the king, yes, yes, we saw you, Lord. And others will have to say, no, Lord, we didn't know it was you. And then he'll smile and say, I didn't come to trick you or test you. I didn't even come to judge you, though that will be the final outcome. That's the way of the world. But the judgment is not the goal of my coming. The goal is love. I've come and I will continue to come to offer you love, to teach you to love. That's what the king will say. In that way, Christ our king is like the mighty ruler in Kierkegaard's story. He comes in love to win us, us for love. Now, this is what distinguishes Jesus from all the false messiahs and their self-aggrandizing power. Our king comes in humility, emptying himself, taking the form of a servant, suffering and eventually bearing a cross. He comes washing us in the saving strength of his sacrifice, not with, with anger or violence, but in compassion, with strength and trust. Like Kierkegaard's king, he doesn't want fearful, groveling subjects. Instead, he calls us friends. He calls us as partners in his service. These, all these ones that he identifies as the least of these, are of no lesser value. They are least simply because of circumstances. And likewise, those of us who might be considered greatest are more than they, well, we are that way because of circumstances as well. We didn't earn it. And Jesus did say that those who have more cannot patronize or look down upon or in any way diminish those who have less. Instead, we are to see one another. Seeing uh, allows us to, to lift each other up, offering comfort, and sharing power and privilege Kierkegaard said, Kierkegaard said it perfectly. It is only in love that the unequal can be made equal. I don't know if the parable of the sheep and the goats was on Tim Hart Anderson's mind when he saw Larry Boyce for the first time on the doorstep at Old First Presbyterian Church in San Francisco. That's where Tim was pastor called Old First most of the time, and it's the oldest continually active Protestant church in California. The year was 1990 when Tim first saw Larry. Larry told the pastor, I have AIDS. I will paint your church in exchange for a place to stay. Now, Larry had already asked 11 other churches, and all of them had turned him down, and, and Tim also looked skeptical. Larry looked a wreck in a worn-out Air Force jumpsuit. Tim remembered that there was a kind of wild look in his eyes. He, he thought, well, this church needs painting, but I'm not sure. Tim had met more than a few charlatans trying to take advantage of the church. We have two. What Tim didn't know was that Larry was a renowned conceptual artist and a painter of Victorian ceilings. He had done frescoes for many celebrities, including the vice presidential offices of George H.W. Bush. Sensing Tim's uncertainty, Larry pulled out his portfolio, and, and Tim couldn't believe what he was seeing. This man's work was brilliant, but he was sick, likely too sick to paint. Nonetheless, the church got on board. They 
converted a, a small basement room for Larry, and he began working with the property committee of the church to design a ceiling that would take the church and Larry on a spiritual and artistic odyssey. Larry had famously said, a room without a painted ceiling is like a world without sky. I think Michelangelo would agree with that. Larry spent hours lying on the polished wooden pews of Old First, its 150-year-old sanctuary, looking up at the ceiling, gazing at the stained glass windows, studying all the architectural details. Finally, finally he decided that the project would be to transform the, the outer lobby, known as the exonarthex from a dingy gray box to a magnificent meeting space. He completed the design drawings, but when it came time for the stenciling of the ceiling, he was too sick to climb up the scaffolding. So members of the church did it. Though they knew next to nothing about ceiling painting, Larry led them. He would, he would lie on the cold, hard floor, Jan Lynn style, and direct the crew painting up on the scaffold. He knew he was dying. Larry had grown up Catholic, but as a gay man, he had always felt rejected and excluded from his church. He was amazed at the way Old First Church accepted and loved him, but his health continued to decline. It was 1991, the, the same year Magic Johnson announced that he had HIV and when singer Freddie Mercury died of the disease. And there was precious little in the way of treatment in those days. As Larry struggled with his health, the volunteers continued painting. And to everyone's delight, in the spring of 1992, Larry formally jo joined Old First Church. He took his first communion as a Presbyterian, but it had to be in the hospital. Two weeks later, Larry died at the age of 46. After that, a team of church members, including an insurance agent, a retired army sergeant, several lawyers, an 85-year-old widow, and a 55-year-old man with developmental disability, continued the work on the ceiling. In early 1995, the painting was complete. On Easter of that year, the congregation came together to dedicate their exonarthex narthex, to the glory of God and memory of Larry Boyce, a friend who came among them, hungry and thirsty and imprisoned by disease, a friend who showed them the glory of the living God. The dominant feature of this painting is a dove representing the Holy Spirit that descended from heaven at Jesus' baptism. The grapevines over this dove represent our other sacrament, communion. Communion in Christ. Communion of all. Communion with Christ, the King, who said, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the foundation of the world. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Let's pray together. Holy God, as you came to us in Jesus, the one who had no place to lay his head, help us to see you, to see your face in all those who cross our paths. Give us hearts of hospitality to reach out, to risk, to love today and tomorrow and every day to love. Amen. Oh, God.
you, Seek Band. That was amazing. And now let's say together what we believe using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. Today we have the privilege of introducing new members to our church family here at Woods. This past week, these people have met with the Commission of Elders of Session who have voted them into membership. They have answered a questions of their commitment to the church and to Jesus Christ, and we now present them to you. Scarlett and David Radulis. Scarlett and David were married in 2017. They are both from Honduras. Scarlett has been here four years and completed an internship at Woods CDC. As of August in 2019, she joined the staff of our CDC. David has been here for a year. He studied architecture at the university and his hobbies all relate to artistic endeavors. He enjoys photography, art, and music. He freelances in architectural areas. Scarlett enjoys crafts and do-it-yourself projects. She really enjoys working with children and doing those projects with them. Their faith background is non-denominational, but they connected to the Presbyterian Church while they were in Seattle. Lisa Hussey. Lisa has been married for 26 years, and she and her husband have five children, ranging in age from 13 to 24. She attended Woods for almost 10 years, and her older children were very involved in Woods work and Fun in the Sun and Winter Relief and other youth activities. Two of her children confirmed at Woods, and the youngest is now going through the confirmation class, and Lisa is assisting with those classes. While living in Pennsylvania, they attended a Catholic church. Now she and the family are intent upon watching the kids participate in sports and enjoying their growth as Christians. Lisa also loves to spend time solving puzzles and scrapbooking. Lisa and Chris Blanchett. Lisa and Chris have been connected to Woods through the CDC. Their oldest, who is in the second grade, attended the CDC, and now their four-year old is enrolled. Lisa grew up in the Catholic Church as well and enjoys coming now to the welcoming atmosphere here at Woods. When they have time, Lisa and Chris like to take the boys out on the boat and fish. They own a company that has been around for over 30 years and specializes in geothermal drilling. This keeps Chris very busy. Both are very passionate about helping others and are happy that they can help their employees. Now they are hoping to spend more time with their family and focus on their children as they grow up. You will be able to see these bios in your bulletin and hopefully sometime soon in the future meet them in person. We welcome them and are thankful that they are with us. A portion of this morning's offering goes to support Habitat for Humanity. Habitat for Humanity and Woods Church have a long enduring partnership, which like so many other things in this pandemic has been interrupted this year. Unfortunately, Woods youth were not able to go out and build houses in support of Habitat for Humanity this year. But nonetheless, we can still support that mission through our giving. We pray that you would help us in supporting that mission and experience the richness that giving brings. 
We also remind you that you can give at woodschurch.org or by texting to 73256. Now please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing on these tithes and offerings that we bring to you. We also ask your blessing on the mission of Habitat for Humanity and the people that it helps who are so desperately in need. We pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us come before God in prayer. King of kings and Lord of lords, we celebrate your authority and your rule over all that is. We thank you for creation and for the reality that you did not abandon us to the forces of nature or to the power of our own wishes and desires, but instead you continue to watch over us and guide us encouraging us always to be the best that we can be. 
We are inspired by your authority over heaven and earth and by your great love for us to be servants and disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ. As such, we become caregivers and helpers in bringing about your kingdom here on earth. Through our prayers, we seek to unite in peace and justice in your name. We strive to live as you intended, with compassion and fairness, focusing our actions upon what is good and hopeful. And so we pray for our nation, our world, and for one another, with the intention of spreading your word to all who will hear it. You are indeed King of Kings, more powerful than anything or anyone who might try to divide us from you. We thank you for this church and this faith that sustains us always. We pray for members of this particular family of faith here at Woods. We pray for Cher Atkinson and Donna Brown, Pete Cooper and Bob Downey, Zelma Gossard, Art Johnson, Corinne Minton and B. Perry, Edie Segree and Suzanne Taylor, Janet Wallace, Pete Bishop, Betty Butler, Carolyn Decker, Carl Erickson, Shirley and Griff Hall, Ted Lewis, Jeff and Linda Norris, Joan Rohrbach, Marie Sheldon, and Charlene Van Meter, Robin Williams, Dave Bremer, Jean Campbell, and Carly Dent, Chuck Gosnell, Margaret Huddleston, Alan Lupfer, Tom Page, and Gresham Roy, Marilyn Sickles, Anne and John Beach, and Jeff Wood. Lord God, we ask for your comforting presence with Dick Thiel and Michael Major on the death of their wife and mother, Margot Thiel. We pray for Warren Paul Brockett on the death of his sister, Catherine. And we give you thanks, O oh God, for the birth of Turner Avery Costello, grandson of Mary Jane and Rick Messick. We ask your blessing upon the parents, Julia and MJ Costello. We pray for our mission partners and co-workers around the world, particularly in Guatemala and Mexico and Malawi and Cuba. We ask your blessing upon our military personnel and their families, upon volunteers and first responders to crisis. Keep them safe and keep them in the vision of peace for our whole world. And we pray for health care workers, for Beth Bender, niece of Karen Mack, and for Jennifer Campbell, Marianne Coucher's niece, for Cindy Howard, Barb Acock's sister, and Lindsay Jones, niece of Karen Mack, and Beth Kupfer, niece of Karen Mack, for Stephanie Lewis, daughter of Nancy Guncoff, and for Karen Mack, for Kendall Marone Parrott, granddaughter of Vic and Carol Ann Marone, for Tabitha Walton, sister-in-law of Rachel Lundy, and for Jim and Molly Weaver, nephew and wife of Linda Weaver. Lord God, there are so many prayers that we offer these days, and we know that you hear them all. You know our hearts, and so we come before you with those trusting hearts and prayers and ask that you hear us now as we pray the prayer your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
enough to celebrate Jesus Christ as our Lord and King. Our purpose is to make his reign a, a reality on earth and to bring it to those around us by our words and deeds. The way we do this is to live as he lived for others in love and service, welcoming all to grow and serve in Christ. God, help us to see one another as you see the world. May Almighty God bless you in this work. May you live in peace, love and serve Christ our King. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.